Howdy, fellow Vine Trippers. I wanted to take just a moment before the show starts to let you know about a great website called Texas Wine Lover. They can be found at txwinelover.com. And they have a comprehensive website that can become your go-to site for information on Texas wines, winemakers, and the wineries that can be found in this state. They even have a phone app that you can download, and that will help you plan your route to create your own wine trip. So make sure and check them out at txwinelover.com. Welcome to Texas Under Vine, an exploratory podcast to scout out the best that Texas wine country has to offer. I'm your wine guide, Scott, and I'm here to lead you on an auditory expedition to the vineyards and wineries across the great Lone Star State. Each episode will cover a different vineyard, winery, or wine-related business operating in Texas. You'll hear interviews, descriptions, and details about each location that will excite you to visit and experience them for yourself. Ready to plan a wine tour? Use these episodes to choose the most interesting spots for you and your friends to check out. Most of all, enjoy hearing about the rapidly growing wine industry in the state and what makes our wines and wineries the best. Howdy, fellow vine tripper. Welcome to episode 16 for Texas Under Vine. In this episode, I got to visit a really cool hot spot in Austin. It's called Wanderlust Wine Company. So this particular location was actually started by Sammy Lamb. They have two current locations in Austin, one on the east side of Austin, which is the one that I visited, and another one that's downtown on 6th Street. They're actually currently about to open their third location in a couple more weeks on Barton Springs near Lady Bird Lake. Hopefully, podcasts will be a big premiere for that because it's going to open up on Memorial Day weekend. So if you're listening to this show as it's released, be sure to go out and check out their opening weekend on Memorial Day weekend. Wanderlust is not a traditional winery like you might think of, but it's a fun place to try many different wines. They're actually the largest wine on tap winery in the world. Their East location has over 80 different wines to try from all over the world. And yes, they even have some Texas wines. They work with a keg-based system to get wines from many places and provide them via their unique tap system. So this is pretty cool because it allows you to try different serving levels of different wines based on money that you load into your quote-unquote digital corkscrew, which is a reusable and reloadable card when you come in. So when you come in, you load up your money on your card and you can go grab a glass and go to any different type of wine, pick your serving size. So if you're not sure you're going to like it, you can get just a small taste. Or if you know it's one that you really adore, you can get even bigger amounts into your cup. You just put your card in, tell it the amount you want it to pour, and then you use the keg uh, tap there to pour that amount into your cup. They even offer fun wine cocktails like frozen margaritas with an agave wine base and get this, wine-based jello shots. They strongly believe in sustainability as kegs can actually contain up to 26 bottles of wine. So that keeps less bottles out of the landfills. It reduces their carbon footprint. And as opposed to a bottle, when you tap a keg, the wine can stay fresh inside of that keg for up to a year because there's no oxygen contact. So if you find a wine that you really like, you can purchase some in a growler that you can take home and enjoy there if you want. Although they bring in wines from all over, they've actually started their own line called Passport Wines that they are going to produce themselves as well. And they're going to begin increasing that, uh, what they produce in-house as they go further on in their business model. They are surrounded by other breweries on the east side for those in your party that might not want wine. So you get a lot of different options for them. Now, I recently got to sit down with Sammy to find out more about what they're doing at Wanderlust and especially at their east side location and and to hear about their exciting expansion news for that third location opening soon in Austin. Let's hear the story directly from him.
So I'm here with Sammy Lamb at Wanderlust Wine Company. So tell me first off, Sammy, just a little bit about yourself. What got you into this industry? So I'm now 31 years old. And for the past decade, I've been involved in the uh, wine industry in one way, shape or form. Um, they call me the wine cowboy. <laughs> and I'm originally from McAllen, Texas, down south, but uh, lived in San Antonio now here in Austin. So Texas born and raised, but I uh, got to travel a lot during um, my college years more than anything. And then my my early and, and mid 20s, um, I just I, I was able to discover wine in that process of traveling. And that's kind of where the name Wanderlust Wine Company came to be. Um, but yeah, we're here in Austin. And by the time this podcast comes out, um, we will more than likely be opening our third location on Barton Springs Road. So we'll have uh, three centralized uh, tasting rooms here in the uh, Austin area. All right. Well, tell me a little bit about the place. So uh, you do things a little differently than some places that people might go at a traditional winery or vineyard kind of place. You have a tasting room. They have their wines they're producing there and so forth. Tell me a little bit about what makes you unique and what's different about Wanderlust. Definitely. So Wanderlust, we, a few things about of who we are. So we're known to be the world's largest wine on tap winery. And so we currently have at our, uh, at our second location, uh, 80 different wines on tap from around the world. Um, and that's kind of what makes us unique and different. So we're essentially a hybrid of a wine bar, but also a an actual winery that is producing different uh, products uh, throughout the year. And the more that we grow, the more products we get to do from around the world. Um, so guests can come on in and, and get some, you know, well-known wines that they're familiar with, as well as some of the stuff that we're working on ourselves. Now, why did that come to be? It's, um, you know, in a simple term is a, being like a kind of a wine merchant, a uh, negociant and uh, people familiar in the wine scene. We we look up to and we uh, we love the people out in Venovium. So we're essentially a uh, kind of like in a parallel world in, in a more, you know, metropolitan area type of Venovium concept with the option for guests to also self pour their own wines at their own pace. I'm paying either by the ounce, half a glass, a glass or a glass and a half at a time. Um, so it's a really fun self-discovery journey that we, we're bringing to guests, patrons, and allowing them to try wines from around the world at their own pace and budget um, without committing to, you know, either a glass of wine for, for, uh, primarily, but more than anything to what one winery has to offer. We like the uh, variety. I think coming from a millennial perspective, we like variety. We don't like, I guess this is, uh, this is my opinion, but subscribing to one thing, we like to be a little bit... Um, fluid and what we want to be drinking and our tastes constantly change and our preferences based on what's exciting. So we want to stay on top of those trends. And, uh, but we also understand and appreciate tradition that, uh, something that is very well seen and done here in Texas. So tradition and, you know, perfecting a craft is also something that we admire. So we work with Texas producers, showcase those that do offer their wines in keg for the most part. And, uh, and then also we're offer variety from around the world. So, yeah. Well, tell me um, a little bit about your location's history. So you've got two locations right now, a um, third one on the way, and we're sitting in one right now in kind of East Austin area. Uh, your other one is more downtown, kind of near 6th Street. And then, um, and then you've got a third one coming, you said, off of Barton Springs. So how did they get started? Where, where did you start with all of this and how did it grow from there? So, uh, yes, downtown on 6th Street and I-35, we're literally the first thing that you'll see as you come into downtown Austin uh, is um, is our flagship store, is our flagship tasting room. And we actually were producing wine there when we first launched. Now, um, I like I was mentioning, I had worked in the industry for about, now at this point, about 10, 10 years, but at that time around uh, seven or, or eight. And... Um, I was working for different wineries. I guess the more recognizable ones would be Underwood, the canned wine company, because they, they were the most recent ones, but were aligned with my alternative and innovative packaging uh, aspirations. Uh, Chateau St. Michel, they were also one of my um, bigger names. And then, funny enough, we're sitting at the second location, which we call the East Side, but it's, it used to be the former uh, Infinite Monkey Theorem here. And so Infinite Monkey Theorem is a winery, urban winery based out of... Uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, and they've expanded and they expanded here to Austin first in South Congress, and then they moved to this current location. And so I worked for them, but only as a volunteer. And so the the funny kind of full circle story is that 
they couldn't hire me at the time, but they did have me as a volunteer. So I would volunteer to try to learn as much as I could about the wine industry. And, but, uh, when the time came to actually pay bills, I had to get a real time, a full-time real job. So, um, I worked for other smaller wineries in, in the Denver area. And then fast forward, you know, at, the, at that point, about five to seven years after, um, I, I came back to Austin, to Texas, but here, Austin specifically, and they still couldn't hire me because they were at capacity. I mean, they were, they were doing okay. They didn't need extra hens. Um, so I was like, all right, well, I'll start my own thing. And, uh, and then during COVID they were going to close shop. They're still well doing well and, uh, and operating out in Colorado, but they wanted to close their Texas branches. And, uh, and so they said, this is the perfect fit, um, because, you know, because of proximity, because of, uh, resources and everything and the shared relationship, we were able to take over their facility. And, uh, and that's where this second location came to be. I mean, it, it, if people were like, were you expecting to expand this fast? No, it was just kind of like things that happened during the process that made sense that uh, came together and allowed us to now open new frontiers and new doors to different tasting rooms and uh, in concepts and, and expanding our community reach. So, yeah, it's like a kismet moment almost. It was just couldn't couldn't quite. Yeah, that up. I yeah. Sometimes you're like, oh, did I shoot myself in the foot? It's a big responsibility. You know, it's like having two kids, and when you're like, oh, I, one was fine, one was enough, and then you have two, and now we're going for three. But um, to your question of why um, I had been working in the industry for a long time, and you know, my, primarily my dad, he was just like, hey, like you should do something for yourself. I think from a uh, different schools of thought, you know. Um, the millennial mindset is more like keep traveling, keep do, keep being free within your craft so that you can always feel fulfilled and happy. Um, but, you know, he's from a from an older school of thought and he's more like, you know, build your foundation, build something that you can be proud of. And both are valid approaches. He uh, he just definitely ignited that fire that was like, OK, I need to start doing something for myself. Um, and it was very tough. I mean, it we really have been fighting against the waves of of what the world is throwing at us from COVID to all these things. But, you know, we started where we could and we bootstrapped, um, took out that SBA loan to start. And we really flipped a beaten down, worn down uh, warehouse in the smack middle of downtown Austin, flipped it and turned it into an awesome self-port tasting room with so many challenges of location. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to provide a concept that would allow people to enjoy wine in a very easy no pretense, no snobbery, just kind of way, you know, if, if you're out and about hanging out with friends um, and you're grabbing drinks that the bar has to offer, I just want to see more wines being featured. And the wines that we typically see in those types of environments are not very good quality. So I wanted to make one more uh, accessible and then within our concept, be able to tap into, no pun intended, but tap into uh, a way that accounts people customers can enjoy great wines have access and enjoy great wines in a more sustainable way because on top of that you know we only do for now um keg wines like we are opening small uh bottle programs here and there for for bottles and producers of, of wine that we really respect and want to be want to see featured um that we can't get in keg because of a lot of reasons but for the most part, I mean, kegs are going to have essentially the equivalent of 26 bottles of wine in them. And that means that you're preventing 26 bottles of wine from going into the landfill. So there's, I mean, obviously there's all these other questions that then follow, such as like what type of recycling programs exist, uh, if you're using plastic kegs versus stainless steel. Um, but all in all, our efforts are, are aligned with making wine more sustainable, having a less carbon footprint and more accessible and inclusive to anyone that wants to drink it. So it's a, it's a fun, it's a, it's a fun program. It's a fun concept that takes a lot of work because it's always new developments, new information, new knowledge that comes to, uh, that comes to us. So that helps us allow, allows us to be better and, uh, and offer a new and, and, uh, cooler opportunity for everyone that comes in. So how does the process work if somebody wanted to come in? Do they, you, you talk about keg wines, um, self-pour. Uh, what is it that you offer and, and how does that work for a customer? Definitely. So here we're very laid back. As a matter of fact, our, the first name we were going to call ourselves was uh, the Texas Chill Country. 
um, because we were so relaxed in that sense of come on in, enjoy a glass of wine. I mean, wine is supposed to be a relaxing beverage. Um, and so as you come in, you're greeted, you're checked in, of course, got to make sure you're 21 plus to consume alcohol. And then we set you up with a, um, what we call the digi- digital corkscrew. And what that is, it's a, it's a card that, that is linked to your credit or debit card so that you're able to pay as you go and pay for what you pour. So a lot of people jokingly call us the Dave and Buster's of wine or the gas pump of wine because you pay for what you pour. Um, and so once you're set up, it's really a, a fun ability where you don't feel intimidated by a sommelier or somebody behind the bar telling you what you're drinking, how you should be drinking it, and what you should be getting out of that wine. It's more of a wall uh, where you have upwards of 64 wines that are self pour at least at this location, 56 that are downtown. But 64 here where you get to learn about the wines through the tasty notes that the uh, producers are actually creating, not what you know our staff is trying to make you feel like you should be uh, tasting and, and smelling. Uh, and so then you can assess and be able to go through that journey uh, and be basically tasting by the ounce so that you're committing to a, a small amount and portion at a time without without feeling like, oh man, I just spent 20 bucks on a flight that I don't like at all, you know? And so here, if you spend a dollar or two dollars on something that you're like not very happy with, you at least got to experience it, learn about it, and say whether or not that fits your your palate. Um, and we offer all types of wines too on the wall. So if you're um, if you need some direction, our staff can definitely assist, and that's where they're their best um equip their best equipped for guiding your desires versus like them selling you onto something and so we offer wines that are more traditional wines that are more on the natural low intervention low sulfite um and then we've got all the way to wine-based cocktails that right now are very um very popular and very exciting um so margaritas we can even do ranch waters we do all these kinds of things that really allows us to fit into the area that all wineries like all, all wineries love the ability to be a winery and have that sense of romantic views and tasting room and stuff like that. But then there's always that point where it's like, okay, can I offer a beer? Can I offer a cocktail? And there's always that limitation. So of course we we have our limitations as a winery, but we do get as close as we can. Like we don't have beer, but we have sparkling mead, which you know, it's not like the medieval medieval drinks. It's actually really nice. It's almost like a fruity beer. Um, and so we're also elevating that category, which, you know, has also gone a long way. Uh, we offer ciders, cocktails, and all these things that push the limits of what a t- winery tasting room can look like. And so for, I guess, to, to answer your question in one simple sentence, it's we're a winery with a tasting room that is offering the most it is pushing the envelope and is pushing the boundaries of what a tasting room can offer. And so we do drag brunch. Like right now, we're about to witness here our weekly um, drag brunch. We do uh, live music all the time, comedy. Uh, we've even done metal shows, which metal and wine, you're like, why not? Let's give it a shot. And uh, so we're just pushing the boundaries. And I just wanted to see wine once again be seen and, and used in any type of element uh, because at the end of the day, it's still not alcoholic beverages, but it's in my opinion, the best that you can be getting is just what are you getting and how are you getting it? And so that's where we're, we're constantly working on providing great experiences revolving around wine. So types of wines, uh, broad variety, dry, off dry, sparkling, rosé, white reds. Definitely. So we do a range of wines. And so most of the wines that we can source in keg already are going to be dry and, uh, and, 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 why rosé red? I mean, that's your your basics are covered. Um, it's actually harder to get sweeter wines in keg, if you believe it or not. And so we we do get some off dries, but our sweet program constitutes less than like fifteen percent. I mean, we have a large offering, but um, I'm constantly searching for really great sweeter off dry wines, off dry to sweet wines that um, that patrons can go and taste at their own pace. But right now, we only have we only have less than ten as a whole. Um, and so most of the wines that you'll see are going to be dry, whites, rosés, reds. Um, the varietal, in terms of varieties, uh, we're going to, I strive to get as many of the off the beaten path varieties so that guests can sample and try things and, and get the opportunity to experiment without feeling, once again, that commitment to a full glass. Um, 
but it really depends on the limitations of harvest of the producers that we work with and their intention to put those types of varietals in keg. It's a whole, it's a, how do I say this? It's like a constant battle of trying to get producers to put their really cool stuff in keg for us. And then, um, and then we offer it here. But even with the constant, you know, challenges that we face, we still have a great amount of variety. So we, we currently see on a continuous rotation, about 13 countries represented in our, in our wine list offering. Um, and we want to grow that more and more. On top of that, we see about, um, I would say, 20 different varieties out of that, too, that we can, that it just depends on the harvest and the producer um, we can source. So we've got stuff as, you know, tradition as Chardonnay, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, Tempranillos all the way to uh, Bobao, Verdejo, Albarino. Um, what else have we gotten? We've gotten some white Tempranillo, which is really cool. We have, we have amber wine. Um, we have uh, Agiortico and Moscofilero, which are Greek varieties. Um, you name it. We've seen, we've seen some really cool stuff come in keg. We've even seen like uh, Bordeaux. Uh, Cru bourgeois kegs come in, and that's really, really cool. So, in terms of when people think keg, you know, it's our our job is to work on letting people know that it's coming in keg. It's not cheap wine. It's great, cool, and awesome wine coming from great producers that are tapping into the world of sustainable practices, and they want to see their product shown in a different uh, platform than just your traditional, you know, shelf at a store or a restaurant. So, yeah. And then, of course, like I said, the cocktails and the uh, the fun drinks, as we call them, we do wine-based jello shots, wine-based cocktails, wine-based, you name it, vermouth. We, we play with some vermouths here and there, too. So, cherries, I mean, we have a good range, and and just depends on seasonality and also, like, if there's a certain uh, interest from guests, we, we're always open to feedback, and then we really strive to obtain those types of products uh, for the guests. Really, I mean, our whole whole approach to the keg world is and our kind of slogan is from barrel or tank to glass and it's kind of like that you know farm from farm to table type of concept where you really are not seeing that wine sit in a small vessel or container and just you know potentially going through all these things that won't provide the best example of what that wine should look like so it's fresher it's more sustainable it's more competitively priced depending on who sells it of course but um, all that in mind, like people are saying, so you can get really, really good stuff in keg. And I'm like, no, you can. It's just dependent on the producer that decides how, what they want to put in it. I mean, they're like, can you put in an aged one? And it's like, sure. They just have to put it from the barrel. If they've been aging it in barrel for a while, they can put it into a keg. And so, um, there's a lot of potential in the world of kegs. So yeah, so I, I love alternative and sustainable packaging. I mean, but we're going to get into, besides kegs, um, we're going to get into the world of bag and box and offering premium wines in the bag and box category um, within this year. So that's kind of our, right now, our whole focus has been our tasting rooms, but we haven't had a product that customers can take home. Um, they can right now, they take it in a growler, but that means they have to drink it within the next week pretty quick. Um, and the bib will just allow for more of that six to eight week uh, duration of, of, uh, of shelf life when they, you know, uh, tap it open. And that was funny enough how kind of like you take something that you don't agree with and then you make it work. Um, in the beginning, they, the bib game, I was so um, upset that they would call those wine on tap. And I was like, a bib, a bag and box is not wine on tap because it's out of a bag. But now we're jumping into the world of bibs because of the sustainability and the, the fact that you can recycle some of these things and, uh, and also have wines around the world on tap. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to feed into it. I'm going to actually jump into it because the reality is that customers don't all have a kegerator at home and can tap into a full keg, even though the keg can last them for such a long time. The reality is that, you know, one and a half to three liters or, um, is more easy to, easy to drink than 20 liters. So, um, so yeah, so we will continue to strive and be, and continue to be the world's largest wine on tap winery from both the keg and the uh, bib game, so. And I would think the, the bib there allows you your longer shelf life as well because you're letting less oxygen in, so it's going to have longer shelf life. No oxygen is just pushing it out, yeah. and uh, yep. I mean, it, and plastics are, 
permeable. So, I mean, that's the thing to, to consider that over time plastics do allow oxygen in. So that it's still six to eight weeks is a long time. And, uh, and that, that allows for people to have one glass a day, keeps the doctor away kind of uh program. But, um, but yeah, so we're going to hopefully release those like in the next, uh, in the next two quarters. What are your favorite wines that you provide? Right now it's our wines that we, um, that we're putting into the, um, uh, into the offering. So we have a Sauvignon Blanc and a Cabernet Sauvignon and, uh, and then a Rosé as well. And those are my top three in terms of like, obviously within each category. Um, we've got some other ones that we also do, but those are the top best ones. Sauvignon Blanc right now is extremely popular. Um, everyone that's doing Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, it's, everyone's doing Sauvignon Blanc, which, you know, it's just. At a certain point, like you're like, oh man, how long is this gonna ride? But if if you think about it, like it's one of the most crisp and clean and easy drinking wines out there, and can also offer some type of complexity. We lean more towards the greener, more herbaceous side of the Sauvignon Blanc, more of that like New Zealand type of style. Um, but it still offers because ours are made in Spain. They still offer obviously a little bit more of that riper fruit. But we really try to preserve uh, that cleaner, easy drinking wine because it gets so hot here in Texas. It's like it's like drinking something so fresh and, and easy in a, in a hot summer day. So we love that uh, style and approach. Um, our Cabernet is going to be definitely nothing to compete with Napa. Napa does such a great job with their fruit bombs. Um, we like something that's a little bit more easy drinking, especially if you're putting it in keg, there's likelihood that you're chilling it a little bit. So a lot of our wines that we serve on tap, they're going to have that slight chilled um, temperature. And so you know, if you're going to have that type of wine, we want to make sure that the, the tannins are under a certain amount because you don't want something cold and tannic, want something cold and tannic, aggressive in terms of fruit. And I think as a whole, I like to see more fruit forward wines in our program because anything that's more dry or tannic won't taste to the, to the best of their example. The best thing too is like, you know, we get a lot of um, questions all the time. It's like, do you know, do customers have an issue that it's chilled. And I said, you know, we have more um, complaints when a wine is too warm rather than it's chilled because chilled, you can obviously warm it up in your hand. And we're not, we're not like putting it in a, in a freezer. We're putting it in a cellar that's literally serving wines 45 for a white, it's about 55 for a red. So that's type of the, uh, the best storage temp. So it's like these wines are being stored proper cellar temp and being st- served to you like as if you were in a cellar tasting in, in a winemaker's basement. So it's kind of a cool concept where you get to try wines, how they are stored, if you will. Um, and then the Texas heated, I mean, it really, that glass in like two minutes, you feel it go up at least five degrees. I mean, it, it's, it's really insane how our temperature is down here. Um, so yeah, so with that understanding of serving and, uh, and the types of wines that I like, so fruit forward, um, approachable, easy to drink, especially for the tap wall program. And then for wines that have a little bit more of that rustic and uh, I want to say antique, but earthy uh, floral, um, dry floral notes, uh, we have that um, in, our, in our different, we actually have a wine vending machine. So that, that it's the same concept of like technology innovation. Uh, and so folks can get some of that more traditional um, or not even traditional, but more or old, or old world type of wine. Um, and yeah, and have that two differentiating uh, standpoints and offerings for different guests with different palettes. I want guests to come in so that they know that it's like, hey, if I go to Wanderlust, I can find something from around the world, either on tap or in a bottle. And I will, as a wine nerd or wine a curious drinker, I will find something that appeases my taste. And, uh, and like I said, we strive for quality. We strive for um, getting stuff that's funky and cool and hard to get in general and putting that on tap as well, so. I do want to touch a little bit about uh, the production, the wines that you produce, actually, rather than negotiate from other people. So where do you source the grapes and, and do you do the production here in-house? Do you do them at another location, like a custom crush, and then bring it in? Or how, how do you handle the production of those wines? So when we started, um, we we're actually working with uh, Hoover Family Vineyards, um, and that was the first batch that we did. Uh, and so we were sourcing grapes from here. We were going to start expanding our grape contracts and programs in Texas. But when COVID hit and we had to pivot, 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 pivot and adapt, 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 it was harder for me to justify 
making wine and running a wine business when this was entirely my my whole livelihood at this point. So negotiant and wine merchant um, opportunities arose. And so I started uh, working with other producers to um, essentially like, I guess the easiest way of saying it is like, I became the executive chef of winemaking. Instead of being the, the sous chef or the people that are there cooking, you're the executive chef saying, this is what I want to get from, this is what the breaks that I want. These are the, the acidity levels. This is um, the type of, you know, oak program, if anything. So it's more of the technicalities that makes wine fun. Of course, you know, our goal is that the, as we continue to grow, we'll have even more control over every step of the process. Um, and that's every winemaker's like dream to have a full vertical, almost supply chain control of their product because they can offer consistency. But at our current state, we love variety. I mean, that's the whole purpose of Wonderless. It's like you don't have one consistency in one brand or one wine. It's like I come to Wonderless to always have a discovery, a self-discovery journey of a new product, a new one, a new style, and never having to feel like, oh, you know, like I really just want this all the time. And that is approaching a certain demographic and a certain generation um, because we know, in fact, we cannot compete with like, and this is, I mean, I don't know how I hope people don't get offended by saying this, but like, let's say people are really in love with Belle Gloss and they want that Pinot Noir from them. And so it's like, they love that style and they're going to go to the store and say, it's really hard to compete with the volumes and the market reach that they have. But what we can offer is something unique, fun, and constantly changing that keeps people on their toes on the sense of like, I wonder what they have now available. And I wonder how funky and cool it'll be compared to like last year's harvest. Or even for us, like we call we call our harvest quarters or quarters because uh, every quarter we, it's like what other things we can source from different producers that they've been aging, that they've been uh, working on, and that it's going to be ready for us to come in and either blend or or finish and fine tune those technicalities that we want to see. Because every quarter, then we'll be able to supply a new you know new assortment of stock that can feed into our different tasting rooms. And, uh, and offer another unique set of lines of products. But yeah, so varieties are, are kind of our wheelhouse um, and, uh, and stuff off the beaten path. And do you have your label, your own, wait, 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 somebody comes in, do they know they're tasting yours? Is it Wanderlust, Cab, Sauvignon, or, or how do they know that they're having yours versus some other promoter? Definitely. So uh, if you see Passport Wines, that is a directly produced wine that we are involved with. Um, Wanderlust wine co brands are going to be something that we partner more on, um, that we are having less of a, um, a full control program on. And it's kind of what we're able to just finalize blend and kind of get into, into keg, um, versus passports are going to be something that we get more, how do I say our hands dirty, if you will, and our hands really involved in not dirty, but hands more full of, uh, sweet, lovely grape juice. So those are the ones that we're, um, we're really working on. So we started with the Wonderlust Wine Co. ones, um, and now we're going to be pushing a lot of the Passport wines because now we've gotten to the point of creating uh, our wine programs more fully and more developed than we were able to do before based on, you know, either how much time we had, uh, what programs we were going to really invest in without understanding what the world was going to throw at us next. And, I mean, to be honest, where that kind of started with us was more of the, your wine-based margaritas. So Wanderlust Wine Co. Uh, products are going to be more of those like finally blended products where we get agave wine and we create a margarita. So it's not really a, a directly a wine product if, you, if you're defining wine as just, you know, uh, fermented juice from grapes. Uh, the Wanderlust Wine Co. label was strictly more on that kind of like we're just going to finalize a blend with, you know, agave wine and however we wanted to craft those cocktails. And then now Passport is more of the traditional, we're in the, we're in the fields, we're talking to the winemakers, we're getting involved in the process. Our approach for that last year was primarily just Spain. Spain was the easiest to work with. Um, and so and w in terms of what we could accomplish was amazing. Uh, and so, and also, you know, with organic grapes, lower intervention, low sulfite content, um, there was so much to do, especially with the keg category that was not seen before. And so we were very excited to get involved with those projects rather than just like, you know, blending cocktails and stuff like that, which is fun. But, um, but it goes back to like what you got to do to like keep 
keep the lights on versus what you want to do as your passion project. So Passport is the is the wines that we are handcrafting, if you will. And then one of this wine core, more of your fun beverages that are more just blended and uh, and uh, and then used for your day to day consumption. Yeah. What are some of the most popular wines that you see with customers? The cocktails. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, margaritas. We're in Texas, so margaritas are your you know your top sellers everywhere, and sangrias too. Sangrias do very well. Um, rosé always does very well. Rosé you know year long is uh is a top seller and uh in recent i guess recent um months Savignon Blanc like I said has been flying off the shelves people just love that and especially as the hotter months are here approaching quickly you're gonna see a lot of Savignon Blanc and a lot of rosé being sold Cabernet does very well the last quarter of the year just because it gets colder people want something a little bit richer um but yeah Savignon Blanc and rosés are like they fly. I mean, that's crazy. And then the cocktails. And you know what? We also do, um, like I said, jello shots. And so, you know, we, we lean on the fun side of wine. So we do everything that's, you know, just a little bit um, pushing the envelopes, if you will. And so those jello shots that are wine based are uh, are a huge hit. You're, you're going to start right now hearing all the people yell from drag brunch behind us and they're, they're probably enjoying some jello shots. So, well, that leads me perfectly into the next question. So, um, I love everything about the feel of the place. It's a very Austin type feel, a very fun and playful environment and relaxed, as you said, chill. So what types of events do you have here? Let's talk about the location a bit. Well, what types of events do you have? Typically you talk about the drag brunch, but what other things do typically you have? And, and do can people actually reserve for their own events or things like that? Definitely. So we we have by like I said, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have that third location operating. Um, and so we'll have one location uh, strategically located at in the main parts of, of Austin. So you're going to have one where we are right now is East Austin, Golbao, if you're more precise. And so we're near the airport. We're near Circuit of the Americas, Concourse Project, all these things out here towards the airport. And also within the what people are, are starting to call the, the brewery district, because you've got High Sign, you've got Coco, Central Machine Works. So we're out here. And so in terms of corporate events, this venue is huge, can fit anywhere from 400 to 600 people, has a lot of rooms, breakout rooms. Uh, we have food trucks outside. So it's very fun, eclectic, has so much to offer and so much visual stimuli that kind of correlates with so much sensorial opportunities on the wine wall, of like different things from around the world. So it's just very eclectic, so much to do. We have a lot of vintage and antique decor um, with a lot of mural art. And then we've got downtown, which is great for uh, South by for conferences coming in. More of your, I wouldn't call it your touristic uh, location, but definitely does get a lot more tourism um, because it's literally this is the first thing you see when you enter downtown. It's like the best location, um, and so that one is about a two hundred person capacity. And that, and then we have the third location coming up on Barton Springs. That's going to be in front of ACL. And for Trove Lights and summer, I mean, if you're going to Zoker Park, it's on the way there. So we're going to have that opening up. And so the venues uh, will have something for everyone, whether you're somebody that's more outdoorsy, you're going to go to the Barton Springs location, whether you're somebody that's more into the, not I wouldn't call it grunge, but the raw Austin, keep Austin weird vibe, you're going to go east. Uh, if you want something kind of in the middle of both worlds, you're going to go downtown. Uh, also, a lot of great bars and restaurants to go before or after you visit us. Um, and they, and then every location has a variety of events. So we do drag brunch, music, bingo, trivia nights, uh, live music. We do comedy shows. We've done, like I said, metal band. We do painting with a twist type of classes. You know, people get to come in and, and paint as well as get a, a wine tasting and a charcuterie board. Um, we've done, uh, charcuterie classes, pasta classes. Um, so anything that can happen within a taste room we've we've attempted at some point we do um one of the cool things we're doing right now monthly is uh it's called austin swapping it's a clothing swap or basically in a, a swap of different accessories uh house goods stuff like that and so you bring a few items and then you get to take that same number of items back um and it helps the community starting COVID, and so people in east austin come together and they do this this huge swap and it's crazy and then the rest is donated uh, to families in need. So there's a, there's a great mission. 
Uh, it's a fun time, and uh, and that's happening once a month. And then, yeah, I mean the the fun doesn't end uh, with what we have. Like it just keeps. We just keep finding ways to keep adding things and and trying things at least once, um, as long as it makes sense for everyone. So, yeah, and putting the, putting wine at the you know at the front of those types of events. That's what we're doing. And then um, your operating hours. So what t- what times do you typically open? So right now during the week, we're opening 5 to 10 uh, or 11, depending on the location. And weekends 12 to 10. Um, right now, East Side is actually closing at 5 p.m. So for the most part, 5 to 10 or 12 to 10, but uh, with some exclu- exceptions here and there. Um, as we get bigger, and right now, the, the main project, which once again, by the time this podcast is out, we'll probably have the third location open, if not at, at about 80% done. It's going to be including, it's growing our operations and including a coffee program as well in the morning. So to kind of feed, you know, now that we've done wines for around the world, we want to have coffees for around the world too. So it's, uh, it's something that we're working on and extending our hours to now accommodate more of that co-working space and uh, just coffee vibes and, and experiences at all three locations. But it'll take a minute. I think by the time this podcast comes out, we'll at least have the, the third location with the coffee program in the works. And then by the end of this year, we'll have all three locations with a uh, coffee program and wine program. And so from 8 a.m. till, you know, 10 p.m., uh, we'll have wine and coffee. Whenever coffee hour is done, you go into wine directly. Um, so it's a little little side thing that we're working on. And uh, but yeah, for now, 5 to 10 weekdays and 12 to 10 weekends. And then um, some of the things that people might want to know if they're going to come visit. Okay, I've got little Judy and Johnny here um, that I don't have a sitter for. Can I bring kids with me? Absolutely. So we're a family-friendly venue. Um, alcohol is strictly 21 plus years of age. Um, for the events that we host, you know, we because we're a family-friendly venue, we always I let people know if it's something that's that would require parental uh, discretion. Um, but yeah, the more the merrier here. I know that on <laughs> on weekends. We have a lot of families that come in and they bring all their kiddos and they're just hanging out, drinking some wine. And that's awesome. I mean, the sense of, of community, we don't want to be a bar necessarily. We want to be an open space, an inclusive space for family, for people to just come and enjoy a glass of wine. Okay. What about pets? If somebody wants to bring in a dog, cat, bird? Yes. We're also pet friendly. <laughs> Flying lizards, we're still working on that one. But um, uh, downtown and... I would say downtown only has the outdoor right now available for for pets, but east and the west location will be basically um, outdoor and indoor. West is so small in terms of the indoor space that it really wouldn't count. <laughs> but um, but I, I would say if, if you really want space and want an indoor space, especially for the summer, east side is your, your space to go because it offers so much. It's like a huge beer hall uh, flipped into a wine concept. And you have plenty of space. A lot of people bring their pups. Um, but if you want an outdoor pet-friendly space, all of them offer that. And then uh, food options. You mentioned um, some charcuterie things, food trucks. What, what types of food options do you have? So um, at the east side, we have uh, tacos by Tacos TJ. Can definitely fill you up when you're by your second glass of wine. Um, and so the charcuterie boards are going to be something present across all three concepts because you know charcuterie and wine are match made in heaven um east or downtown will have a tapas right now currently has a tapas concept uh and so they have about i think 12 at this point 12 different tapa options that you can get in terms of the toppings that you get on the tapas um charcuterie as well and uh and they're they're great they're a great team they're always um innovating on what other menu items they want to offer and uh yeah so that's always a fun time and then the the west, we're gonna have the taco truck as well, the one that's at the east side. They're gonna have an extension there, um, and we're also gonna have an in house, just minimal charcuterie and live bites, and you know, uh, breakfast pastry stuff like that. Uh, more of a live bites. We are surrounded by a lot of great restaurants in that area, and we want to be more of the uh, the grab and go or the grab a glass and sit down for a little bit, and then continue the night going. And then for the third location, we're gonna have a really cool. Uh, concept 
the third location is on Barton Springs Road. It's a two-story building that was built. All of our buildings, funny enough, were built around the 1930s, 1940s. So they, they all carry some character. But the third location is going to be the, the one concept that leans a little bit more on the bottle program than kegs. Because that one's going to focus on storing and offering really great timeless and traditional types of wines, as well as a variety of like your your everyday and then also your natural and funky types of wines as well. But wines from around the world that I can really, to the to the idea, the concept of Wonderless can really touch and and reach wines from around the world and, and offer them in-house. And, um, and we actually found that this building has the lower deck or the lower level built onto the hill. So it's kind of um, one of the few places in Austin that I've seen that's actually built as a wine cave would be normally. So we're going to, we're working on, you know, making sure that it's, it's fun, it's cool, it's decorated and it's uh, structurally um, sound so that we can get a really unique wine tasting experience for guests would be about an hour, 60 minutes. And they would get to taste five different wines and travel through an underground um, wine cave and uh, and then, you know, enjoy the greenery then afterwards. Or if they want to hang out, we'll have more wines and tacos and charcuterie boards and coffee for them to enjoy. So <laughs> do you have any maximum group sizes or things like that? Do you no. need to make reservations for big groups or? No, we, uh, I would say both downtown and the uh, Barton Springs location would be has have a capacity of about 150 to 200 people. Uh, East side is our, by far the largest venue with four to 600 people. Um, and so th- for any groups that are, you know, relatively large, we always encourage them to go to the East side so that they can feel the space they can enjoy. And, uh, and also there's all the breweries around us that can accommodate large groups as well. So it's kind of like a group friendly area, um, for more smaller groups or, you know, intimate settings with, with, for couples and stuff, we would recommend downtown or West. No reservations for any of them are required, but we are offering uh, prepaid tastings online so guests can come into a more uh, led experience. You know, we do everything self pour, so in this case, they can have somebody that they can uh, that they can talk to in terms of a guided experience through the wine flight, and uh, and it's something that they can just plan for, get in and get out without having to, you know, feel like uh, like they're having to do the self pour. Like if they want more of a sit down experience, we can do that as a prepaid service and uh and it works as a reservation as well so we'll have we have those at all three locations as well so you don't have to but if you do and benefits you get a free jello shot too so <laughs> do you have any um like busy or slow times well, when's the best time to come visit weekends are always fun they always have a lot to offer um a lot of people are afraid to go places on weekends because they can be saturated but we have a uh, a nice ebb and flow at with three locations it's not like uh like people are bound to just go to one of the locations. So it's always spread out. There's uh, different activities and events spread out through each location strategically so that none of them are bombarded. And we can also spread out our staff and just have a balance of influx of people and stuff like that. So weekends are always fun, always something happening. Otherwise, uh, Wine Wednesdays are our biggest day right now for downtown because we do half off. Um, Thursdays at the east side. And then um, as we open the third location, we may just centralize all the Wine Wednesday specials to one night so that uh, Wine Wednesday can still be the one time a week, the the day of the week that you're like, oh, it's almost weekend, and you get those nice, great uh, wine specials. Now, um, if I may, I'll kind of segue quickly to uh, the Wine Collective. So we have this thing called the Wine Corner here in Austin, um, and would love for for Texas Under Vine podcast to go in and spend some time with them as well. They're similar concepts, but they each have their own approach and, and offering. Um, I, I'm i a big believer in working as a group, as a, as a team, as a community versus feeling like just competitors and trying to um, just, I don't know, knock on each other or, or have the comparison game because it's not healthy and it's once again, we're in, in the world of wine, the industry of wine, where we're competing against beer, spirits, and now NA products, and even recreational opportunities like weed, THC, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that we as a wine community should do to come together to offer great experiences. And I approached um, K-Bottle Room and Blurred Vines about creating what's called the Wine Collective, the Austin Wine Collective. Now, the Austin Wine Collective is essentially a partnership between the three of us that 
works in the sense right now, currently, as it stands as a wine passport. So people buy uh, a wine passport and then they get to do a little wine crawl, if you will, with a glass of wine at each location. And then they get a, a t-shirt at the end as a kind of like, it's almost like a scavenger hunt, treasure hunt, but with wine as your reward at every location. And then you get a free t-shirt as a commemorative little, you know, um, souvenir. Uh, and so we wanted to just increase the awareness and promotion of wines, of, of wine in the, basically the epicenter of downtown Austin, because we're all located within 800 feet of each other. And downtown Austin, I guess they would technically be considered East Austin because they're right on the other side of I-35. But, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's such a great opportunity right now for all of us to just raise awareness that there's great wine opportunities for any type of wine connoisseur drinker uh, and you can get you know blurred vines specializes in uh west coast wines for the most part so a lot of napa a lot of really cool stuff on the west coast mainly california and also some oregon pinot stuff like that uh with some exceptions to like other stuff around the world as well but that's kind of their bread and butter so if you want that napa experience high end very you know uh elevated experience um, that's the space to go to. K Bottle is really cool because they focus only on South African wines. So if you want to kind of take a different path and kind of explore a new category, they have really, really cool examples of the South African um, category of wines. And also elevated experience, smaller, more intimate. And also, like I said, within 800 feet. And then you go to Wonderlust, fun, eclectic, has a little bit from all around the world more laid off. Um, but I will say, and all of our staff are sommeliers. So they all passed at least their level one. Um, and so I just actually finished diploma and going to go in about two, three weeks to go get my, my diploma in London. So I'm excited, uh, to go do that. But the, the journey here, you know, it's not about just making wine too fun and forgetting about the fundamentals. It's about offering great wines, providing the same service, but more in a, in a untraditional, non-traditional way that offers a new experience, a new opportunity for anyone to come in into the world of wine, still have the same experience and uh, guidance from a sommelier, but also be given the freedom to create their own memories and experiences and self-discovery journey at their own pace, budget, and time. What, in your opinion, is the number one thing that sets Wonderlust apart uh, that would appeal to people to come check you out? So... Waterless, once again, and I'll, I'll try to keep this in, uh, as short as possible, but Waterless Wine Company is the world's largest wine on tap winery with offerings of up to 80 different wines around the world that guests can enjoy, most of which can be self-poured and, uh, and tried by the ounce, half a glass, a glass, or a glass and a half. So if uh, you're a curious wine drinker or entering the world of wine and kind of want to explore what your palate is all about and what you really love or want love in wine and kind of want to explore those uh, horizons we are the spot because there is uh, a program here that lets you try many wines from around the world and uh, lets you assess those things instead of somebody imposing those ideas onto you um, it's a robust offering that is constantly changing so it keeps people uh, continuously looking forward to what's going to be offered next and all the cool things that we can source in our ever-evolving um position as a company and the networks and the connections that we're getting to do through Wonderlust. Um, and it also offers a unique Austin experience and vibe. Like if you come here to this, the, the East side location, it was a building built in the 1930s has high, it's, I think it's the second, uh, tallest still standing wooden structure in Austin. Um, and so it's huge. I mean, it feels like you're in a big, big barnyard, big warehouse, uh, kind of like a beer hall, but it's a wine space, but it also looks like an art gallery, but it also looks like an auto shop. Like you're like, what is going on? It's just so much raw, eclectic excitement based on all the decor, uh, decisions that were made. Uh, so if you just want something that's unique, fun, offers a large variety of wines, um, come to Wanderlust. We have also a lot of rotating, uh, food programs and partners that are always exciting to find new and creative and fun ways of pairing wines with different types of foods and cuisines. Um, and then if you just also are looking to do something um, as a group, we're very group friendly, we're pet friendly, uh, we're very inclusive, uh, and we love to be a part of our community. I think the, the main recipe for our success in the last three years has been 
involving ourselves with the community and creating such powerful connections with uh, the people of Austin and, uh, and offering the best pricing two in one. Like I said, the biggest tip is, hey guys, we use Rito glasses that are 20 ounces. Like they can fit almost a bottle's worth. So if you fill your glass up, you're filling it with almost like four glasses of wine, the equivalent of. So we're, we're the best priced. Uh, we have wines around the world. You can pour at your own pace. Um, and it's just a fun, no, no pretense, no snobbery type of place where uh, if we don't have something that you want, let us know. We'll probably be able to source it in bottle, but hopefully more likely, uh, our approach would be more likely than in, uh, that we'd love to see it in keg, but if we don't have, we can't find it in keg, we can find it in bottle for you. So, and as we grow, we'll be your coffee shop spot too, co-working space. Um, yeah. And then you'll see us hopefully in the next, in the next, within this year, in the next probably six months, you'll see us at, in the retail front, um, in the bag, bag and box category. So. April 11th, we're hoping to do our soft launch of the third location. If, uh, if y'all get a chance, definitely visit us between then until Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend is when we hope to do a full launch of that third location. Obviously, should no delays, um, big delays in, uh, occur. But uh, come check us out. Support us at the, at the third location. And, uh, and stay tuned for a lot more really fun, cool things um, to happen within the world of Wanderlust. And in terms of what Wonderless is able to do within the Austin area. So, all right. Well, that's the end of my questions here. Is there anything that you feel like that you wanted to express or share or talk about that maybe I haven't hit on yet or, or anything like that? Any final details or anything you want to throw in? So, in terms of Wonderless, you know, besides all the, the fun things that we're doing and all the programming and events, um, once again, we're here to promote the continuous growth of the Texas wine industry. And one of the main things that I saw as a calling was putting my brand and my company in the, once again, the epicenter of the, almost the wine, the biggest wine region in Texas, right? The Hill Country. And from when I, when I started, they were saying that the Hill Country was the second most visited wine region after Napa or Sonoma, something like this. I don't know. I, I bet that's changed, but, um, but that's still some, a statistic that's very impressive. And, uh, and I can see why. I mean, our hospitality, our beautiful views like out here, the accessibility more than anything. Like you go to, you fly into Austin, you go to the Hill Country, it's within an hour and a half. So everything, and it's a scenic fun ride out there. A lot of great food too, barbecue. Like it's, there's just so much that just made me decide I wanted to be in Austin rather than in the Hill Country because at this point, the city's alive. There's so much to do. Um, and once again, I wanted to see the Texas industry grow because as a born and raised Texan, I, I love, I have a pride for our state and, uh, and what we can offer as a state. So, um, our quality has gone Im immensely greater, uh, training, education, knowledge, resources for the Texas wine industry is growing, growing, growing. And, you know, when people are saying, you know, is wonderless, just like cheap wine and something, it's like, once again, we want to almost, um, uh, debunk or, uh, or justify our position in the sense that, you know, we're all trained sommelier. I had my education within the OIV, which OIV is too many um, who don't know of it. It's kind of like the UN of wine. They're kind of the international regulating body for wine. And they uh, they created a, a wine master's program uh, about 35 years ago. And I was the first Texan to do this program, which, you know, obviously brought a lot of pride. But um, I wanted them to now recognize Texas as a reputable wine growing and wine producing and wine consuming state. And, uh, and f last year we were able to bring the first group of students, uh, from the OIV as, and then uh, kind of like interesting enough, two weeks later, the OIV recognized Texas as one of their uh, observing states. So we are now as the, as a Texas wine issue, we're now entering a new chapter in our, in our, in our history of the industry, which is amazing, and the a level of recognition that we haven't had before. So these small steps towards uh, big improvements within within the industry is something that I'm also striving for on the side. And Wonderlust is still kind of at the forefront of that. It's like, even though we're making wine fun and making it very on the accessible side, like we're still very serious about the craft of wine and what we can achieve for each other within the industry. And uh, Austin Detours actually helped me lead the uh, the inaugurating kind of reception of, of the OIV. So all that said, it's uh, 
Wonderlust, even though it may have an image of just fun and like easygoing vibes and everything, like under the surface, there's a huge push for growing our industry, uh, our our wine community, our wine education appreciation in our state, uh, but more than anything, like growing the wine industry in Texas as a whole. Um, and then the other thing I was going to just say is uh, for folks that are here in Austin, I just want to do a quick shout out to Austin Wine Society, uh, which I think you are also familiar with. Um, uh, the guys that are in charge of that group have done um, huge, huge um, events in the Austin area and are really bringing in the wine community in our city um, for people with all different kinds of tastes and uh, and it allowing um, all different wine brands within our state to just have more accessibility to the people in Austin and our growing community of Austin, right? Austin's like now it's a big transplant city, but, uh, but still there's a, there's a huge love for wine and Austin, Texas wine society has helped bring in together um, a lot of wine um, enthusiasts, lovers, and, uh, and yeah, just big shout out to them for, for helping the industry grow here, especially within the city of Austin. What a great shout out to the Texas wine industry by Sammy and Wanderlust. I had so much fun hanging out there with sampling many different varieties of wines with their unique self-pour digital corkscrew card. I can't wait to go back and bring others to experience this unique offering. And three words, wine vending machine. Yes, I could hardly believe it when I saw it. Really fun concept that you don't just see every day. Sammy also gave me a sneak peek of their new Barton Springs location. It's currently in a soft open type phase as they're building and still doing construction on it. But they're going to have their big launch in a couple of weeks on Memorial Day weekend. It sports a treehouse style landing where you can sit and sip your glass. It's also got a cool speakeasy style tasting area and a type of a wine cave down on the lower floor. They even are going to have coffee options available at the new location. And and so they'll have lots of great options for you. And there's great restaurants in the area as well if you want to eat first before you go in. When you decide to make a visit, first check out their website. It's www.wanderlustwine.com. You'll find info about the Austin Wine Collective Passport that Sammy mentioned, as well as all of the details of the three locations. Their operating hours, parking information, even events and event reservations are linked there. Don't forget, when you go see them, make sure to tell them you heard about them on this podcast. Well, I still have a lot of wines to try, but before I go reload more onto my digital corkscrew card, I better pack up and head out to see more great wine destinations and bring all those fun details to you, the listeners. If you're enjoying the show, would you please consider sponsoring the show as a Patreon subscriber? It starts at just a few dollars a month, and there are levels that provide all kinds of behind-the-scenes content that you can't get anywhere else, like photos, videos, even sneak peeks for what places are coming up soon for episodes. Plus, those funds help me make some road trips to even further destinations around the state to bring more great wine info about areas that might be closer to where you live or even want to visit. Closer to where you live, just go to the Texas Undervine website and click the Become a Patron link at the top. Well, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Follow my socials to be notified whenever the next episode is posted. Until next time, happy trails and bottoms up, y'all. Thanks for listening to Texas Under Vine. We strive to provide you with the best information about wine businesses all over Texas. Be sure to check out our website at texasundervine.com and follow us on our socials at Texas Under Vine to stay up on all the upcoming episodes. Please email us with any suggestions or feedback. Also, contact us if you're interested in donating, sponsoring, or advertising on the podcast just to help us cover our expenses and bring even more great info to you in future episodes. Of donating, sponsor safely, and most especially, drink responsibly. Don't forget to also check out the Texas Wine Lover website and their phone app. If you want to plan a trip to the wine destination I talked about in this episode, the site for Texas Wine Lover and their phone app that you can download will really help you organize a trip so you can go see them. You can check out all of the goodness that I got to experience while I was there. 
But as you're planning your trip, while you're on their website or their app, you can also find out things like accommodations, restaurants, and even some fun events and things that are going on at the wineries. And maybe even find one that you want to experience as part of your wine trip that you never even expected. So check them out. Again, it's TXWineLover.com. <laughs> 